Järgnevalt tuleb meile kõnelema Egle Eerik, kes möödanud aastal Tartu ülikoolis lõpetas ühe väga põneva teemapüstitusega lõputöö kaitses selle edukalt. Ja tema hakkab meile siis rääkima sellest, et kuidas kaastundlik olemine või vooruslikus eeldab meilt veganlust. Palun Egle. Hello. So uh, today I will uh, present uh, an argument in favor of veganism that is based on uh, virtue ethics. Um, so first we will look at the argument, but uh, my main focus uh, will be explaining on the first premise. So I will explain why I chose the virtue ethics approach. After that, I will uh, introduce the concept of flourishing Then I will go into compassion, I will analyze compassion as an emotion and then as a virtue. After that I will go into compassion's criticism and explain uh, why I don't agree with said criticisms. And then I will com connect uh, compassion to animal ethics. And last but not least I will argue uh, what is the reason that comes from virtue ethics uh, that explains uh, why we should be compassionate towards non-human animals and why we shouldn't hinder their flourishing. Um, so the argument uh, is the following. Premise one, we should not hinder the flourishing of other humans and non-human animals. Animal agriculture hinders animal flourishing. Supporting something that hinders animal flourishing counts as hindering animal flourishing. Buying the products of animal agriculture counts as supporting animal agriculture. Thus, uh, we should not buy the products of animal agriculture, so we should be vegan. Uh, of course, we could reach this conclusion by using other approaches, so I will explain why virtue ethics. In animal ethics, um, the virtue ethics approach is uh, quite new. Even though um, virtue ethics has its roots in ancient philosophy, in its, with its founding fathers uh, Plato and Aristotle, but before virtue ethics, uh, the two main approaches to animal ethics were the deontological approach and the utilitarianism. <coughs> Tom Regan and uh, Peter Singer uh, both emphasize animals' uh, moral status, this uh, abstract concept. And although both of them do appeal to compassion um, by describing the horrific conditions that the animals have to endure, their arguments are not based on compassion. Um, Singer promotes uh, utilitarianism, the view according to which uh, the right kind of action is the one that maximizes the most happiness. And uh, Tom Regan bases his arguments on the concept of animal rights. And although they have gained the uh, public's attention to the topic of animal ethics, um, they haven't been successful at stopping the exploitation of animals. Of course, the problem isn't easy to solve, uh, so this is why we need also other approaches to talk about this issue. And I suggest that one beneficial way to argue for veganism is to focus on uh, what kind of uh, person one wants to be or should be, a uh, virtuous, compassionate one. When one is virtuous, one also acts virtuously and compassionately towards animals. So applying virtue ethics to animal ethics shifts the conversation on how to treat animals away from uh, rights, duties, the consequences of our actions, which are sometimes hard to calculate. Um, rather, it promotes considering our behavior towards animals in terms of virtues and vices. Um, so what is flourishing that I have already mentioned? Um, according to Aristotelian uh, philosophy, eudaimonia, or flourishing, is our end. It's our life goal. Um, in addition to flourishing, sometimes it's also translated as happiness or well-being, but um, happiness is subjective and uh, flourishing can also be determined by a bystander. 
So in order to understand compassion as a virtue, first we have to look at compassion as an emotion. On the whole, um, Aristotle proposes that there are uh, four main beliefs that are necessary to feel compassion. So one has to believe that um, the hardship that the target person is going through is severe, uh, that the target person is not, at least not entirely, to blame for his or her situation, that one or one's close one could also happen to be in a similar hardship, and that the suffering happens near one. Uh, in addition to this, uh, White Bruin also proposes that uh, compassion can occur to someone, uh, towards someone who is in a vulnerable position, exposed and can be wounded or injured, and doesn't have to be suffering greatly necessarily. For example, some farm animals. Um, in small cases, their living conditions are not that horrific but they're still being held captured, so they are certainly in a vulnerable position. So um, we can extend Aristotle's uh, definition of compassion. Um, compassion can also be regarded as a virtue. Emotions uh, we feel involuntary, but with virtues we make deliberate choices to act in a virtuous way. If we just experience compassion, uh, it is an emotion, not a virtue, but virtues regard also actions. According to Aristotle's definition of virtue, virtues are disposi dispositions to feelings and actions. Uh, we can become virtuous because of our dispositions, but uh, we have to deliberately practice being uh, virtuous. Um, and. Um, yeah, acting compassionately means not causing harm to others or, and or alleviating others' uh, suffering. Uh, compassion has also been uh, criticized uh, in the following three ways. Um, some uh, see compassion as irrational. Um, they, uh, they can mean irrational in two different ways. First, uh, it can be thought of as a non-cognitive force which is separate, separate from thinking or reasoning. Uh, secondly, and more commonly, people might think that uh, compassion is prompted by thoughts uh, that are bad or false in uh, some normative sense. Um, Emotions can definitely make us think that something is rational when it is not, but um, we also make mistakes while it's reasoning, so it doesn't follow that we shouldn't reason if mistakes some, sometimes occur. And for Martha Nussbaum, compassion is a certain kind of reasoning. It's concern about the comfort of others, and the individual and community both need it in order to function together. So we should de develop a greater understanding of this moral emotion in order to promote it. We don't have to eliminate it uh, in order to be rational. Uh, the other part of uh, criticism claims that compassion is connected to anger and revenge. Uh, external goods, uh, such as water, are necessary for human flourishing. So our life is not entirely up to us. Uh, someone or something can hinder our or someone else's flourishing. So we might get angry and in some cases also want to seek revenge. Um, but still there are reasons to promote compassion, even if it is connected to anger and revenge. Anger, if it is uh, prompted by moral concerns, doesn't have to be a negative emotion. In fact, virtuous people uh, should be angry in some situations. Being angry at the right uh, people, at the right time and place, for the right amount of time, is virtuous. And anger can also be a motivational force. For example, if uh, one is angry 
at the current state of the world, how animals are being exploited and killed prematurely for no good reason. It could help one to become an animal rights activist and be involved with campaigns that fight this injustice. People uh, who don't feel anger at all are not likely to f defend themselves or others. Um, of course, one should not become overwhelmed with anger because that's not productive. It's uh, important to remain compassionate at the same time as virtues are all about balance. And in addition to that, revenge also means that uh, we want to harm others but uh, by exercising compassion, we will not want to harm others. Instead, we are concerned for others' well-being. Um, the third criticism is for compassion's partiality and narrowness. Uh, it has been argued that compassion is not reliable. Uh, we care more about some lives than others. We are not compassionate towards everyone who deserves it. Uh, but uh, this is always the case when some emotion will be appealed to the public in hopes to motivate it. Usually in order for us to care about and attend to the good of others, we need to relate to others and understand them. And how could that happen without appealing to compassion? Compassion is often a major factor uh, in why we do the things we do. So even if it's not a perfect tool for motivating people, it does motivate people. So we should uh, use it and promote it so it could be a better tool for motivation. The problem is uh, not with compassion. The problem is that we are not compassionate enough. But compassion can and uh, should be cultivated. Um, the topic of compassion and being compassionate towards animals is not controversial. Most people believe that uh, they are compassionate and love animals. But the animals that they uh, usually consider are pets and not farm animals. Um, but uh, if one is compassionate towards some animals and not all animals, then one is not compassionate towards animals. Um, the four beliefs that are necessary to feel compassion that I talked about earlier uh, relate to our compassion towards animals in the following way. Um, so. Um, the First of all, the killing aspect of animals is uh, pretty severe. Uh, it hinders them from experiencing a good life. In addition to that, uh, the animals are confined in the animal agriculture industry, so they are in a vulnerable position. Secondly, it is uh, pretty clear that the animals have not done anything wrong in order for us to kill them prematurely for food. The third aspect, um, we could interpret the following way. Humans uh, usually want to live, and animals also want to live. It's a bit different, because uh, uh, humans usually have plans for the future, but uh, the will to live still remains. And also, people usually care for their pets, and um, or at least someone else's pets. And we wouldn't want our pet or someone else's pet's life to be ended unless there was a good reason for it. Uh, for example, when the when the said pet has a difficult, untreatable health condition, uh, then euthanasia um, can be acceptable. Uh, the fourth belief. Um, that suffering happens near us uh, is an interesting one because people uh, usually don't think that um, animals in the agriculture industry suffer or at least if they are willing to accept that they suffer they think that it happens in the US or Australia or somewhere far and um, it's not relevant for them in Estonian context 
at, at least. Um, they don't want to believe that the animals that are near them suffer. Um, one way to uh, make people aware of this suffering is through campaigns that the uh, Lomat Animal Organization has also done a little bit, but that goes uh, beyond my research. But um, why we shouldn't hinder others' flourishing? Why we should uh, be compassionate towards animals? Um, as I have shown, being compassionate towards uh, humans and uh, being compassionate towards non-human animals, it's not that different, but um, why? Uh, at first, the uh, answer might seem as simple as that uh, treating animals well is virtuous, and if we want to flourish, we have to act virtuously, which uh, includes acting virtuously towards animals, but uh, still, why is treating animals well virtuous? Uh, first, we have to look at uh, why we should care about other people's flourishing. And then we can see if the same reasons also apply to animals. We care about other people because uh, when we acquire virtues, this is what we learn to do. Uh, it is also in our nature to feel concern for others. However, uh, naturally, we feel concern mostly for our close ones. So why should we feel concern for everyone? Flourishing um, is our end, our life goal. And in order to properly appreciate it, to appreciate flourishing, we have to appreciate it fully for the good that it is, and not just because it is our own proper end. We have to appreciate it for also being the proper end of others. If we only care and attend to the uh, to our and few others flourishing, we are not appreciating it fully. And the reason why um, humans care about the flourishing of other humans, it's not that uh, they are alike, but because they have this uh, common goal, flourishing. By uh, caring about each other's end, we also care about each other. Um, however, how does it follow that we should also care about uh, the lives of animals? Um, humans and non-human animals have different ways of flourishing. Aristotle wanted to find the characteristic human uh, function that would be essential to flourishing, if exceptionally achieved. He thought that living as in growth and nutrition cannot be it because plants and animals have that in common with us. So for him, the characteristic uh, human function has to be reason. But um, as Rebecca Walker argues, this characteristic function doesn't have to be unique. There's no reason, there's no reason why uh, we could not share functions with uh, other animals and plants and still fulfill those functions exceptionally. As uh, human flourishing has to at least partially depend on external goods in addition to the acquiring of virtues and, and maintaining the virtues. And animal flourishing depends on uh, external goods as well. Uh, for human and animal good lives, uh, clean water, physical health, positive psychological states, adequate sleep, uh, movement, sunshine or darkness, relevant social relations are of great importance. So human flourishing and animal flourishing are not that different. So uh, if we fail to care about animal flourishing, we fail to appreciate the kind of good that uh, flourishing is. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I can ask uh, uh, whether you think that, uh, like in today's world, this kind of approach to animal ethics uh, 
would be useful, or could you use that in some some sort of uh, activism or, or or academia or anywhere to broaden compassion and? Yeah, um, I have also seen some campaigns that like um, um, use this uh, way that uh, humans care about their pets more than farm animals. So there are campaigns that are like, uh, why do you care about the dog and not the pig? Because they're like very similar. So they uh, like ex want to extend the human's compassion from the dog to the uh, pig or calf or some farm animal. Yeah.